So, what exactly is a hoik? It's used as a noun, adjective, and verb. You might hear someone say that they built a hoik to hoik into the temple with hoiked blocks. That's just gibberish. The simple answer is that it's a glitch turned feature that's existed since 1.2 involving sloped blocks, which you create with a hammer. Hammered blocks and platforms interact strangely with various objects. They can be used to walk through solid blocks, shoot through walls, move players, NPCs, and items at a high speed, foam enemies, build invincibility machines, and a lot more. I'm going to describe a lot of different hoiks in this video. This is the visual key. It's a color-coded guide on how to hammer blocks to build each type of hoik. Most of the blocks for the rest of this video will follow this coloring scheme to make them easier to identify. If there's a particular type of hoik you're looking for, check the timestamps in the description below. We're going to start simple, with some basic hoiks that are relevant to the normal player. These are things that anyone can build and take advantage of when playing the game. The simplest hoik in the game involves only one platform. Simply put it down in front of a block, hammer it once, hold down as you walk, and you will ignore the collision of the next tile. By using three of them, you can clip through one column of solid blocks. You can use it to enter the jungle temple without a key by going straight through the front door. You could build a one-way exit from a house, which lets you leave without letting enemies come in. You aren't the only thing that can pass through this hoik, of course. Enemies will be able to walk through as well if they're coming from the platform side. And enemies aren't all. Even projectiles can pass through. You can attack from one side of a wall without letting anything attack back. Pirates will be completely unable to damage you as long as you don't spawn the ghost from the captain. You could chain this hoik long distance or use staggered instances of it. You could also put it at the top of a door to let mounts walk through. I used this hoik pretty often during lawnmower only when farming enemies on the don't dig up surface. It has a lot of versatility, and if there's one single hoik you should remember from this video, it's this one. But what if you need to get through more than one tile of solid blocks? Can a hoik do that? Yes, quite easily. Put down a row of blocks to stand on. Leave a one block gap, then put down a block, and then a platform. Hammer the platform once, and then hammer the block to a purple slope if you're going left, and a red slope if you're going right. The platform allows you to clip inside the block, and when the block is hammered like that, it'll move you out of it in the direction you want to go. Remember to press down while walking into the platform, and you'll shoot forward. Stop pressing any keys, and position your mouse cursor at the first block on the wall at your feet. You're going to hammer it and every other block until it looks like this one. As long as your mouse is positioned correctly, you can just keep clicking until the shape is correct and you'll go through. This is a great way to skip to the end of the jungle temple, but it can also be used to get shadow orbs or crimson hearts without bombs or powder. You might be wondering, why would you want to go into the jungle temple early? You can't summon golem. Well, you could get a solar tablet to summon a solar eclipse before the mechanical bosses, allowing you to get bat wings earlier than intended. There's also the loot from pots and chests, usually a lot of money and potions. Sometimes the dungeon generates in a way that makes it impossible to get through without a molten pickaxe or actuators. If that occurs, you can use this hoik to get through. It's even possible to do suicide runs into the dungeon from outside to try to get loot without killing Skeletron. Look for something you want with the Star Fury or similar items, set your spawn point outside, and keep going in until you can get the item without dying. These two hoiks will let you get through any blocks horizontally. But what if you need to go vertically? Let's say you want to go up into the jungle temple rather than from the left or right. That's a bit trickier, but still doable. The simplest way to go up through solid blocks is by placing a single platform at your head and standing at its location, then hammering it three times. This will clip you inside of the blocks and on top of the platform. If the blocks are three tiles thick or less, you can just jump up to get through. If it's more than three tiles thick, you can place your cursor and hammer this spot repeatedly, which will gradually push you upwards. You will need to re-hammer these each time, and it only works in one direction, so this isn't an ideal way of traveling repeatedly. It's a one-way ticket into the jungle temple, but it could also be used to access crimson hearts from below. If you want the hoik to be used repeatedly, you'll need to build something like this. This is a quite complex bi-directional elevator that relies on advanced mechanics. For details on how to build it, check this timestamp later in the video. As far as going straight downward, there's no easy way to do that, either. I describe it in the same section. That is a quick rundown of using hoiks to get through solid blocks, but you can do a lot more than that. I skipped some basics of hoiks to get into the interesting stuff, so let's cover the fundamentals. Hoiks work because whenever an entity with collision is inside of a sloped block, the game attempts to kick them out in a specific direction depending on how it's sloped. Importantly, the object being moved needs to be inside of the block. You have to find some way to enter it, also known as mounting a hoik. There are plenty of ways to do this. You've already seen two if you've been paying attention. Hammered platforms allow you to walk inside of tiles by ignoring collision, putting you directly inside of the hoik. 
The only downside is that, if it's positioned at your feet, you will need to hold down when walking to enter it, because otherwise you will walk up the platform as if it were stairs. This design used invalid platforms, which are described later in the video. They essentially function like red or purple slopes that can be freely walked inside. This is the original hoik mounting setup. They were first discovered because of how players are displaced when stepping up onto a block. Rather than being put here immediately, you're put here for a brief moment, allowing you to hoik due to being inside the block. It's called the step-up method. You can use actuated blocks. If you enter through an inactive tile that's been sloped beside the hoik, you can enter like this. This is because any tile that rests against the flat side of a sloped block has its collision ignored in a similar way to the hammered platforms earlier. Normally, you can't walk inside of tiles like this because there's a block in the way. Disabling it with an actuator lets you walk right through. The nice part about this one is that, unlike the platforms, your character won't attempt to walk up it, so you don't need to hold down to enter it. You can also actuate the sloped block itself, enter the inactive tile, and then turn it on to start the hoik. It's like pressing the button on an elevator. A design like this with a normal platform allows you to walk horizontally without triggering the hoik. If you want to enter it, hold up as you walk. You'll be put on the platform, which then puts you in the hoik. It's good for situations where you want the option of either going up or going horizontally. You can use teleporters since they put you inside of the blocks above the teleporter. Grappling hooks are a very niche mounting mechanism that could be used for some challenge maps. I don't have much experience with them though. And, of course, you can use another hoik. Let's take a look at using hoiks to move yourself around. As you might have noticed, you go fast when going through a hoik. Depending on the type of hoik, you can move yourself at speeds of up to 360 tiles per second or as slow as 20 tiles per second. The speed of a hoik is determined by how far you are displaced. The important takeaway is that the further apart the sloped blocks are, the faster you'll move. You could build a system to move you anywhere in the world very quickly by just entering the correct- What is that? What is a pylon? What do you mean teleporters are pre-hard mode? Okay, well, you can use hoiks to transport yourself short distances quickly. Let's start with vertical movement. The green and blue slopes with their bottoms flat are the hoiks that will take you upward. You'll want to enter from the flat side. Use the green slope if you're coming from the right and the blue slope if you're coming from the left. Conversely, the red and purple slopes are the downward hoiks. You also enter them from their flat side horizontally. Making these two blocks wide helps to make them more consistent. As a rule of thumb, you enter from the flat sides of a hoik and you exit towards the diagonal hypotenuse. With more complicated setups, you can enter from other directions, which I explain later, but you always exit towards the hypotenuse. Remember that, when you hoik, you leave in the direction of the hypotenuse. If you ever forget what hoik puts you in what direction, they will always displace you towards the hypotenuse. In these vertical hoiks, you'll move at three blocks per tick, and each block should be spaced three apart. Note that you can vary this up a little by having every other gap be only one tile instead of two tiles, which you may want to do to make sure it stops and starts where you want it to. Downward hoiks should be entered slowly to avoid overshooting the hoik. If you used an actuated block and a switch, you'll need a platform underneath the entrance that's actuated opposite to the block. That is, when the block turns on, it turns off, otherwise you'll be sent in the wrong direction. You can combine the two of them to make a hoik that works in both directions. It can be as basic as just putting a downward hoik on one side and an upwards hoik on the other. You can use actuators to squeeze it into a two-block space, turning half of the block off when you use it. Of course, these are the simple options. You can make a compact bi-directional hoik without actuators. I describe these elevators later. That's the basics of vertical hoiks. Let's look at horizontal ones next. While vertical hoiks can exist freely without other blocks, Horizontal hoiks need a supporting row of normal blocks alongside them. They need either a floor or a ceiling within two tiles. They also can have up to a one block gap between the teeth and the gap size determines the speed of the hoik. If there is a one block gap, the hoik moves at two tiles per frame, or 164 miles per hour. If there is no gap, it moves at one tile per frame, or 82 miles per hour. If the hoik is not directly up against a supporting row of blocks, there cannot be a gap between the teeth. These numbers will be different for hitboxes larger or smaller than the normal player. Horizontal floor hoiks are what we used to get into the temple from the side earlier. We used a hammered block as the mounting mechanism. That exact same design works for going through normal space too, and we can use a different option to get inside the hoik. An actuated block that's turned on with a switch, an inactive block beside the hoik, or chaining it from a vertical hoik. 
Horizontal ceiling hoiks work pretty similarly, but go along the ceiling instead and use the green and blue slopes. They follow the same spacing rules as the floor hoiks, so I won't cover those again. Remember, you enter from the flat side of the block and exit towards the hypotenuse. This is how you could make one to travel back and forth in both directions. You may have noticed a slight issue here. These are the four vertical slopes. These are the four horizontal slopes. There are only four slopes in the game. They can all take you on either axis, but they will never take you on both axes at the same time. So what determines where you get sent? The classical understanding is that all hoiks will default to moving you vertically unless there are solid blocks above your head or under your feet. This is why horizontal hoiks need supporting blocks. This understanding is a good generalization for basic hoik usage, but it's not true. Check the advanced section for the long answer. Now that we know how to go in all four directions individually, they can be combined to make a hoik loop. Making a loop can be a very effective way of dodging several bosses. Just be careful about knockback. You might remember that I used a hoik loop to kill Skeletron when I beat the game with the copper short sword, since his enraged form can get trapped in the center. Since the Dungeon Guardian follows the same AI, you can trap and kill that as well. Using this design as a basis, we see that we can enter a horizontal hoik by going vertically. So, if we set up a vertical hoik going down to lead into a horizontal hoik going left, which then chains into an upward hoik and then a right hoik, we can create a loop of endless hoiking. It can be entered from any of the sides and scaled to any size. Just pay attention to the corners and how to connect them. When going from a vertical hoik to a horizontal hoik in a loop, the horizontal hoik should start three tiles directly up or down from the last vertical tooth. When going from horizontal to vertical, the vertical hoik should be placed one tile up or down and three tiles to the side. Remember that you can adjust the gap size of every other tooth in a vertical hoik to meet your sizing needs. This hoik loop takes you in a clockwise motion. A counterclockwise loop looks like this following the same building rules for corners. You should have a pretty good sense of how to move yourself around with hoiks now. Let's look at how to move other entities, NPCs, enemies, and dropped items. Every one of these entities can be moved using the same rules as moving yourself. They need to enter the sloped block somehow, after which they will be repeatedly displaced and quickly moved. The entity you are trying to move needs to have collision, so worm, ghost, and similar enemies can't be hoiked, nor can most bosses. Getting an enemy mounted into the hoik can be a bit tricky. Fighter-type enemies will attempt to walk into hammered platforms, but this type of hoik requires you to hold down when placed on the ground. However, if you are below them in elevation, they will attempt to fall down through platforms, which allows them to enter the hoik. This issue doesn't happen when entering a vertical hoik with a hammered platform above the ground. However, the enemy will try to jump, so they need to have the vertical space above them closed off. Using a switch and an actuator allows you to control when the enemy is moved. An inactive sloped block works regardless of your elevation, as does the step-up method. But those are all mostly novelty. The best way to hoik enemies is to designate their spawn location and place actuated blocks that rapidly turn on and off. This way, you know exactly where they will be and don't give them a chance to move before putting them in the hoik. The main utility of moving enemies, as you might imagine, is farming. You can dramatically increase the efficiency of statue farming with clever usage of hoiks. Statues will spawn up to 3 creatures if there are less than 3 within 12.5 tiles, up to 6 if there are less than 6 within 37.5 tiles, and up to 10 if there are less than 10 in the world. So, by hoiking the enemy to 38 or more tiles away, you can farm 10 enemies at a time instead of just 3. Keep in mind that statues have a cooldown of a half a second, so if you're killing enemies in half a second or less, the increased spawn cap won't matter. This setup, for instance, can only get up to 6 blood zombies at once because they die too quickly to reach 10. That farming setup I showed before is extremely versatile and effective. Enemies can only spawn on a valid surface that's at least 62 tiles away horizontally and 35 tiles vertically, but no more than 84 by 47 tiles away. I wouldn't bother measuring exact distances most of the time, you want your spawning area to be just over one screen away if you're playing at a 1920 by 1080 resolution. Let's look at a blood moon in hard mode. The flying enemies have a little trouble getting in the hoik, but it's very effective at grabbing most of the enemies, and they're all shoved into a small area where they're easily killed and looted. We can even use hoiks to grab the loot for us, which I'll show you how to do later. Farming pixies can be tricky if you're using a quarter second timer, but if you increase the speed of actuation, they'll get trapped and brought in. You can also use a slope to catch and funnel them in with a quarter second timer. Just make sure it doesn't go too far out, you don't want anything spawning on top of it. 
If you're not aware, most enemies spawn on specific blocks rather than in specific biomes. If you need to farm dark mummies for an onyx blaster, swapping out the top row of blocks to ebon sand or crim sand will send a bunch of them at you very quickly. You can use this setup for events too. Pumpkin Moon's first few waves will get immediately demolished, but the later waves can get tricky on high difficulties due to the large number of projectiles and enemies that ignore blocks. Be sure to put yourself a bit higher up so you have time to move out of the way. Solar Eclipses can be farmed like this as well, but once you get to post Plantera, it gets quite a bit less safe since Mothvon and Deadly Spheres will ignore it. Make sure you have an escape route for when they attack. Pirates have almost nothing that goes through blocks. Just keep an eye out for the ghosts that spawn from pirate captains. And, of course, you can speed up farming for the Rod of Discord. This is a basic design I threw together that's considerably more efficient than your standard pyramid trap, since it almost completely removes the downtime of enemies walking. The spawning platform is covered with actuated sloped blocks, which send enemies into the center very quickly after spawning. You'll see footage of two versions. One is powered by a quarter second timer, which occasionally lets an enemy escape, and the other is powered by a dummy engine, which activates 60 times per second. Only a rare mother slime clipping through the death box will get out of that version. There are some sloped blocks at each side to catch the bats that spawn and funnel them into the hoik. The walls and platforms underneath are there with spiders so that any enchanted swords that spawn or mother slimes that escape will be killed before they're a danger. I'm also using vampire frogs in the death box to deal extra damage and lock the chaos elementals in place. You'll notice that I did not put down enough pearl stone for the biome to count as hollowed. This will prevent souls of light from dropping and most of the hollowed enemies from spawning, including hollowed mimics which can be very difficult to deal with. This setup is also very good at farming mimics and automatically kills skeleton merchants, two weak points of the pyramid design. As I said, this is a basic setup, there are plenty of ways to improve on it. If you get intimidated by wiring or the idea of a dummy engine, you can make a similar setup without using any wires. Use the slope to funnel flying enemies in and put one row of block swapped platform hoiks down on the bottom. Literally just replace the red and purple slopes with a platform. This will be a little less efficient and certain enemies won't come in like mother slimes and mimics and you have to be below the hoik so it won't work for setups like this but it avoids having to do any wiring. NPCs can be hoiked as well. Since inactive blocks don't count against housing status they're a good way to hoik them consistently. Teleporters also work well. The main reason you'd want to hoik an NPC is to turn them into an engine, which I describe later. NPC movements can be quite unpredictable, so most mounting mechanisms are inconsistent unless you can predict their path, like when it's nighttime. They will also attempt to teleport to a valid home at night if they're off-screen, so if you want to hoik them off-screen you should invalidate their home to prevent this. Items have collision, so they can hoik too. They work under the same principles. The item's hitbox needs to be inside of the sloped blocks to be pushed around, but they're a lot more finicky. Firstly, you're gonna want actuators, and you're going to need to get the items you want to hoik inside of the inactive sloped blocks. The other mounting mechanisms are difficult to get to work in my experience. After that, the size of the item's collision hitbox will determine how it behaves. There are three sizes. I'll use the same naming scheme that Zero Gravitas did in their item hoiking video years ago. Size 1, size 2, and size 3. Size 1 hitboxes are less than 1 tile tall. Size 2 hitboxes are between 1 and 2 tiles tall. Size 3 are greater than 2 tiles tall. It's important to note that the size of an item's sprite does not necessarily correlate with its collision hitbox. Some items look larger than they are, and vice versa. The Flying Dragon, which has one of the largest sprites in the game at 4.5 tiles tall, is actually only a size 2 item with a hitbox between 1 and 2 tiles tall. Let's deal with the smallest first, size 1. Remember, hoiks push things towards their hypotenuse. In terms of horizontal movement, size 1 items can only be moved to the right in a ceiling supported hoik and they won't go through smoothly. You'll have to reactivate the hoik repeatedly. Because these sprites are only a single block tall, that also means you need to have the ceiling hoik on the floor. This might sound extremely arbitrary and annoying, and it is, but if you want to move around coins, hearts, and a lot of other miscellaneous item drops, you need to use this setup. Vertically, it's a bit less restrictive. As you see here, the two upwards hoiks, green and blue, will push the item upwards, but it only goes up one tile, which means you need to stagger actuated blocks each tile to move upwards. For size 2 items, which are between 1 and 2 tiles in size, things get a bit easier. They can actually move in both directions horizontally. The basic floor-mounted horizontal hoik will move the items correctly as long as there are no gaps between the teeth or the floor. The ceiling mounted design needs a gap between the floor, but it can't have any between the teeth. As you can see, the upwards hoik sends size 2 items up the same way as size 1 items. 
However, they need a gap of one tile between the teeth to avoid this happening. They also need to be one tile off the ground. Due to how upward hoiks work, using the green slope will be inconsistent depending on subtile positioning. I suggest using the blue slope. Lastly, size 3 items follow almost identical rules to the player with some exceptions. Firstly, if there are gaps in the teeth, the items may not always be properly picked up. Rightward ceiling hoiks also break if there are gaps in the teeth, so in general I would recommend not using gaps. Going vertically with size 3 items is the same as size 2, except it needs to start another tile up off the ground and there needs to be another tile of space between the teeth. The green slope also has the same subtile positioning issue, so the blue slope should be used. As a rule for transporting items vertically, the uppermost tile of the item's hitbox needs to be in a hoik, while the tiles underneath it need empty space. Size 1 items take up only one tile, so they don't need any gaps. Size 2 items take up between one and two tiles, so they need a gap between each tooth. Size 3 are between two and three tiles, so the third tile needs to be hoiked with two tiles of empty space between the teeth. There are also some items that are too large for size 3. Well, I've only found one. The breaker blade is massive, bigger than the player, it can't fit in these hoiks and they need to be raised higher off the ground. It's in a category of its own, but hoiking it is basically useless so I'm not going to go into much detail on it. I haven't really covered how to hoik items downward yet. Size 1 items can't, your only option is letting gravity do the work. Size 2 items can be hoiked downward like so, but cannot directly enter a downward hoik, they need to chain into it from a horizontal one. Size 3 items can use the same downward hoiks that players use so long as they are positioned to enter it correctly. Getting that positioning can be a little tricky sometimes. It is possible to make a hoik that can transport any item, but it only works horizontally to the right due to the size 1 restrictions. You might be wondering why you'd bother going through all this trouble when conveyor belts exist. The answer is that hoiks move objects at a drastically higher speed and can move items straight upwards. Conveyor belts can also become hoiks themselves, which helps smooth out item collection in many setups. Take this one. As you can see here, certain items like spooky wood and copper coins don't properly get moved up here. This is because their hitboxes are too small, they're getting stuck on the short side of the hoik and they're not getting pushed up into the next block. Using a conveyor belt lets you move the objects toward the tall side so they get properly pushed up. These are a few more designs using item hoiks. Falling stars can be quite annoying to foam by going over the surface if you need a lot of them. They're a size 2 item, and a hoik will let you collect tons of stars with ease, although it is quite labor intensive to make. It took me 25 minutes with a good pre hard mode hammer to make a hoik that is 1000 tiles long. Extrapolating from that, it would take about an hour and 40 minutes to cover a small world, 2.5 hours for a medium world, and 3 hours and 20 minutes for a large world. You can expect to get around 40, 60, and 80 stars per night on small, medium, and large worlds, respectively, with that increasing to 2 to 4 times as much during fallen star nights. Once it's been built, this setup is the best option in the game for collecting fallen stars quickly and in large quantities, but it is very time consuming to build. I would only recommend it if you really want to use the star cannon or superstar shooter, or if you're playing in a large multiplayer world where a lot of people need mana crystals. Heart statues will spawn a heart every 10 seconds, unless there are 3 already present within 18.75 tiles, 6 within 50 tiles, or 10 anywhere in the world. By using hoiks, we can rapidly transport hearts from 51 or more tiles away to ignore the local limits. I suggest placing the heart statues on a conveyor belt to make sure they don't get stuck. By staggering the heart statue activations, we can achieve a constant flow of hearts. If you want to see an optimized version of this setup, check this timestamp. You can do a similar thing with star statues. It's just a more efficient way of using statues if you have more than three. We looked at this earlier, but these are a few different iterations of an item collecting hoik for events. The right half of the arena has spawns blocked with lava for simplicity. The vertical hoik for size 1 items here is being activated every game tick by a dummy engine. Every other tile was actuated before sending the wiring signals to every tile. This version picks up both size 1 and size 2 items, which are most item drops outside of Pumpkin and Frostmoon. You could add in a section for size 3 items too if you wanted. You can also use item hoiks to farm naturally growing items, like all four types of mushrooms, jungle spores, life fruit, and anything similar. All of these are size 2 items, so the same design works for each one. Use actuators to disable the blocks so that whatever was growing on them breaks, then have the items drop into a hoik. There is one other simple hoik that I haven't touched on yet, and that is the block swapped platform hoik, also known as the invalid platform. In 1.4, Terraria added block swapping, where you can replace one block with another without breaking it. Block swapping retains the slope of the original block. However, there is a discrepancy between blocks and platforms. 
Platforms have only four valid states, while blocks have six. If you block swap a platform into a sloped block in a red or purple configuration, the platform is in an invalid state, because it doesn't have a counterpart for those slopes. It will function like the red and purple slopes, kicking out anything inside of it towards where the hypotenuse would be, but since it's a platform, it can be freely walked inside without another mounting mechanism. They also, as you might expect, have some very buggy behavior. Projectiles that have collision will be stopped if they're going in a downward trajectory, but not upwards. Since they eject entities in one direction, but can also be freely walked inside of, they can be used to make an impassable barrier to ground-based enemies. Just be careful not to allow them an area to jump. The enemy will attempt to walk forward, but repeatedly be sent back to where they came from. These hoiks can be very helpful for manipulating enemies to stay in one position with minimal effort. During lawnmower only, I created quite a few of these to help kill enemies, because it would lock their position while still allowing me to attack them. The most useful application of this is the Old One's army. When faced with a wall, the enemies will temporarily gain the ability to ignore blocks. However, platforms are exempt from this, so an invalid platform will prevent their movement without activating their phasing through walls ability. It'll only affect the ground-based enemies, though. The ogre will be blocked, but not Dark Mage, Betsy, or any flyers. Doing this makes the exploding trap very appealing, since everything will be stacked up to one location. On the other hand, you might prefer a sentry that can actually help kill flying enemies, since they're the only threat. Make sure not to place the block-swapped platforms too close to the crystal, or else some enemies will start to attack it. You might remember that I used a large wall of them during the golem section of the boss cheesing video. Golem is quite annoying to Hoik due to his ability to phase through blocks, but this will lock his phase 1 movement. I still haven't found a way to get that to work for phase 2, but I have improved the king and queen slime cheeses with Quasar's help. Originally, I created setups that worked perfectly at the start of the fight, but fell apart later. King Slime's smaller hitbox messed with his teleporting, while Queen Slime was able to hit with the AoE slam attack in phase 2. Since the bosses naturally teleport, they have an innate hoik mounting mechanism built in. We just have to place the blocks correctly. There's an easy fix for King Slime. The problem was that, as it gets smaller, it's able to fit in this 3 block tall space. The hoik works because when King Slime is larger, it gets kicked out instead of teleporting in. King Slime is still wider than the player though, so all we have to do is put ourselves in a space that's only too tall and there's a hoik beside us. That way, when King Slime teleports, it hits the hoik to the side and it gets kicked out. This is what that looks like. By pressing up in the middle of these platforms, we can clip into this block here. Now, King Slime cannot teleport on us. If we're 22 blocks in the air, he can't jump to us either. This setup could even be built on the ground, just be sure not to go too far to the side. It'll also be a bit tougher to damage King Slime like this. Queen Slime gave me trouble in phase 2, because her collision gets weird and her slam hitbox is gigantic. But we can use a similar improved setup like with King Slime. Since last time the setup was too confusing for some people, this is about as bare bones as you can get. This is a platform and three sloped blocks. The type of block does not matter and this platform is not hammered. Simply stand right here and you're done, she can't hit you. Make sure to close off the ceiling here to prevent being attacked by slimes in phase 2 and I recommend using a clinger staff. There's a very low chance that projectiles from her summoned slimes can get in here, so keep that in mind. These blocks are 7 apart from each other. The side walls are not necessary, but they help to keep the summons out and lock her in place if the hoik doesn't immediately kick her out, which can happen if she teleports while moving. The last part of the basic hoik section is going to be on invincibility machines. I made a whole video on these, but I have a new design from Quasar that takes the best parts of both of the previous versions. The basic premise of why this works is that you get iframes from taking falling damage, which makes you immune to anything other than the Empress of Light, Moon Lord, Lava, and the Wall of Flesh's Tongue, because those all either have their own unique iframe timers or ignore iframes. Oh, and also falling damage itself, because falling damage ignores iframes. So, if you take falling damage while still invulnerable from falling damage, you will never take damage aside from the exceptions I named. This machine is set up to have you take damage on the last frame that you were invincible from the previous falling damage. You'll need at least 9, 11, or 17 defense, respectively, for Master, Expert, and Classic mode. You'll also need to reach 3 HP per second of life regeneration. The easiest way to do that for an indefinite period is by wearing a band of regeneration, having a heart lantern, and putting honey in here, but other setups can work too. A regeneration potion, for instance, is 2 HP per second by itself, but it only lasts for 8 minutes. You can enter this machine from the bottom using the hammered platforms or by falling down from the top. Make sure that you are not wearing any items that cancel fall damage. The positioning for this machine is a bit specific. If you're stuck at the top, move to the right slightly. If you're stuck on the bottom, move left slightly. 
Once inside, you will be completely invulnerable to damage from the vast majority of sources. Be warned that it does look awful, and to my knowledge, there is no way to avoid the visual headache. With that, the basic section is now complete. Keep these four things in mind whenever you're building a hoik. Always make sure you know where you're being sent. Sloped blocks displace you towards the hypotenuse. Test your hoiks regularly. You don't want to build a long hoik only to realize that you messed up the entrance or the spacing and you need to break the whole thing down and build it again. Always have a way out when building. Whether that be a magic mirror or the Vod of Discord, you don't want to get stuck somewhere, especially if you're trying to get through blocks that you can't break. Don't move around once you're actually in the hoik. Some designs can be quite positioning specific and will be broken by attempting to move. Everything from here on out is going to be advanced hoik mechanics. These designs are going to get a lot more complex, and I'm going to go into detail explaining very niche mechanics. And you might be wondering, how does the game behave when you are overlapping with multiple hoiks at once? Let's look at this design. When you enter the invalid platform, you're sent into this position here, overlapping with three separate hoiks. So which one gets activated? Terraria has a hoik priority system. It checks in a specific order and activates the first hoik that the entity is colliding with. That priority is the bottom right, middle right, top right, bottom left, middle left, and then top left. Essentially, it checks columns going up from the bottom starting from the right and going leftward. If you are in a situation where you're overlapping with 9 tiles or dealing with unusually large enemy hitboxes, simply add on more columns. This is what allows compact designs with overlapping hoiks to function, like this elevator. Once you enter the hoik, you'll get sent upward here and… hang on, this shouldn't work. Hoik priority would determine that the player is overlapping with the bottom right purple slope, which would send the player downward. But instead, they activate the top right blue slope and get sent upward. W why? Well, to explain that, we need to look at sub-tile positioning. Sub-tile positioning means where you are in a tile. The player's hitbox is less than two tiles wide, so you could be positioned in quite a few different ways inside of a given area. If you remember the copper coins that we tried to hoik earlier, that was a sub-tile positioning issue. When going vertically, an object is pushed to the end of the block. If you're at the tall side of a hoik, you get sent an entire tile upward. But if you're at the short end of a hoik, you're only displaced slightly upwards. The copper coins had a hitbox too small to touch the next block if they were on the short side, so they got stuck and needed a conveyor belt to push them to the tall side. Hoiks can behave differently depending on where you are inside of them. This is why this hoik doesn't work. If you're entering from the tall side, you'll be pushed an entire tile upwards and reach the next block, then repeat the process. If you're entering from the short side, you'll be pushed considerably less than a tile upwards, getting stuck before reaching the next block. If we change the spacing of the blocks, we can make a design that works when entering from the short side. Since we're getting pushed a shorter distance, we need the next block to be closer. We can make a vertical hoik that can be entered from the short side by spacing each block two apart instead of three. Since it relies on you being positioned on the short side, you need to enter it slowly and not move while inside of it. This is also a little slower than the normal hoik since the spacing of the teeth determines a hoik's speed. The second piece of this puzzle lies in a special occurrence that happens when the short end of two slopes are next to each other. In this specific orientation, there is a stronger priority that overrides standard hoik priority. The player will only trigger the hoik that the center of their hitbox is closest to. Because we've been pushed to the left of the elevator, our subtile positioning is on the left. The downward hoiks, because their short ends are touching, check to see which is closer to the center of our hitbox. It's the red slope. The purple slope is ignored, and hoik priority continues as normal until it finds the blue slope. These two do not have their short ends touching, so the exception doesn't apply to them. We're sent upwards where the same thing happens until we reach the top. When going downward, the design is mirrored and our subtile positioning is on the right. That means we activate the bottom right hoik because it's the first in hoik priority and the center of our hitbox is closest to it. This elevator can actually be built as you go through solid blocks and can serve as an effective two-way vertical hoik into and out of the jungle temple. I'd recommend a shine and a night owl potion so you can see well, changing to retro lighting also helps improve visibility. Start by building the entrance. You should be standing on a flat surface six blocks beneath the ceiling. You'll need to place a platform on the fourth tile down with two blocks hammered like so. Use block swap to exchange the red block for an invalid platform. Now, when you jump up, you should be sent to the left, setting your subtile position in the appropriate spot. The actual elevator itself looks like a series of upward pointing arrows. This pattern here with the red and purple slopes followed by unhammered blocks followed by the green and blue slopes needs to be repeated all the way through. 
The mechanical ruler helps a lot here, but make sure to hammer the blocks in this exact order, otherwise you'll be pushed around to places you don't want to be in. If you're building this elevator with your own blocks and not going into the temple, the ordering doesn't matter. If the tile that the top left of your body is in is 0, 0 on a coordinate plane, hammer the following tiles in this order. Negative 1, 0, once. 0, 0, twice. 2, 0, once. 1, 0, twice. 0, 1, twice. 1, 1, twice. Then keep repeating that pattern. Uh, if you suck at math and have no idea what I just said, your character takes up six tiles of space, three tall and two wide. Find the top left tile that your character is in, then hammer the block left of that tile once. Now hammer the top left tile that your character is in twice. Hammer the block two tiles to the right of that once, and the block one tile to the right of it twice. Hammer the block one tile above the top left of your character twice, and then the block one tile diagonally up to the right twice. You'll be pushed upwards where you can repeat the process. Here is a visual guide if you're still confused. Note that in order to leave this elevator properly, the top block needs to be the green and blue slopes. If the number of tiles isn't correct, add extra blocks until it is. To make the entrance to go back down, you'll need to extend the elevator upward by another three blocks. You'll be using red slopes to block swap these platforms. Once everything is set up, simply fall down and you'll be sent through. The thing is, this elevator still shouldn't be possible. If sloped blocks determine whether you are sent vertically or horizontally based on whether there are blocks above or below you, going straight through solid blocks like this should be impossible. But, as I said earlier, that was an incorrect statement that was how hoiks were believed to have worked for a long time. In actuality, you can have a hoik send you vertically when there are solid blocks in the way. If the solid block that would prevent your movement is sloped in a particular way, you will be sent into it instead of off to the side. When going downwards, the blocks that are preventing your movement need to be sloped upwards. When going upwards, the blocks need to be sloped downwards and pointing towards the middle of the player's sprite. Keep in mind that, since this is a sloped block, you will be hoiked by it. You will need to place additional slopes that have different hoik priority if you want to avoid being moved by them. Let's look at another advanced bidirectional elevator design. This general concept is something we already used, in fact. The invincibility machines are essentially a two-way elevator that is set up to deal a specific amount of falling damage at a specific interval. The reason this works is because invalid platforms only trigger if they are at the bottom part of your hitbox. If they are in the middle or the top, they will be ignored. Also, remember that invalid platforms function like the red and purple slopes, which are downward hoiks. So, if we lay out an elevator so that our head hits an upward hoik and our body hits the invalid platform on the way up, the platform will be ignored and we will go upward. Then, on the way down, our feet touch the invalid platform so they are activated and we go downward due to hoik priority recognizing the bottom right hoik first. The bidirectional elevator design that goes through solid blocks is pretty cool, but it has some flaws. Firstly, it can only be built through solid blocks when you're going upwards, you can't go down with it. Secondly, it goes in both directions. You might not need to go in both directions. You can hoik vertically in a reusable way through solid tiles, even downward. It isn't easy, but this is how you do it. I would strongly suggest shine and night owl potions again, along with retro lighting. You need to take advantage of subtile positioning and sloping blocks to allow you to travel vertically when it should otherwise not be possible. We enter this hoik with an invalid platform that leads to a blue slope with the two blocks above it hammered to allow you to enter them. Four tiles above the invalid platform should be another blue slope. When you enter, you will be sent here, and because of the exception to hoik priority, you will trigger the left red hoik. Since the block underneath you is not sloped, you will be sent to the right, where you will hit the blue slope. This is not a valid location to be hoiked. Yet. Create a green slope that is five tiles above the red slope from earlier, then hammer the two blocks above you to allow you to pass through them. Repeat this process until you're through. Downwards is also difficult, but this is how you can get to shadow orbs consistently without breaking the ebon stone. Be sure not to move around when making these as they may break. Use invalid platforms with the blocks below them sloped so that you can pass through. Make a purple slope three blocks down, which will send you to the left. Hammer the blocks into a diamond shape, starting with the bottom left. This will send you downward. Make a red hoik two blocks down, then hammer this block until you're pushed out. Make a diamond shape again and the purple slope to catch you, at which point the process will loop. And this is an alternative and far more fashionable way to travel diagonally downward. You need to hold down when entering it, but then you can coast on through. Almost every hoik that we've looked at has been assuming it is moving something the size of the player. 
But what if you aren't? Whether it be an enemy with a weird hitbox or a player on a mount, not everything is going to be three blocks tall and two blocks wide. The horizontal displacement of an entity is equal to the height of its hitbox minus one. Sharks, despite being quite wide, will only move one tile at a time. This is important if you want to improve the efficiency of a shark statue by hoiking them 38 tiles away. This is why moving size 1 items horizontally was so difficult. Their height is one tile or less, so they don't get properly hoiked because they don't even get displaced by a single tile. A particularly interesting scenario arises when the horizontal hitbox of an entity is different than the sprite of that entity. Let's look at the unicorn mount. The unicorn sprite is very large, 4 wide and 5 tall. However, the hitbox is only as wide as the player, 2 by 5. As we walk towards the hoik, it only triggers when the player reaches it, but it sends us four tiles away. This means that you can place the teeth of the hoik further apart and ignore the blocks in between, or use them for other purposes. You could make a one block tall horizontal hoik that functions in both directions and moves at a very high speed. The unicorn mount, due to its large size, is actually tied for the fastest player hoik movement possible. Remember that displacement happens in a single game tick, or 60 times per second. You normally are displaced two tiles horizontally, but the unicorn is displaced four tiles, moving at double the speed. The same thing happens vertically. The unicorn is displaced by five tiles and not three. Of course, you could set up a hoik to travel slower if you wanted to. With the player hoiks, we saw that having an empty space between the teeth and the ceiling changed how far they were sent. This hoik displaced the character by two tiles, but putting a gap between it and the ground made it only one tile. That pattern is consistent for increasing sprite sizes. The unicorn, for instance, could be displaced by two tiles by using a hoik that is two tiles of empty space. If you've really been paying attention to this video, you'll remember that I said you could move at speeds of up to 360 blocks per second. If the unicorn is five tiles tall, it would only move at 300 per second vertically and 240 horizontally. How can you get that extra speed? The answer is half blocks. The distance you're sent horizontally changes based on the size of the gap between the hoik and the floor, and the distance you're sent is what determines your speed. By changing that gap size, we change our speed. Half blocks let you increase the space between the hoik and the ground. This doesn't make you faster, but it does let you alter your subtile position. When the floor is half blocks, we're displaced by half a tile less, setting our subtile position on the left instead of on the right. If we put that half block on the same elevation as the hoik, we increase the distance we're sent by half a block. That lets us both go further, which increases our speed, and allows us to control our subtile position. Manipulating that subtile position is what allows a two-way horizontal hoik that's only a single block tall, like this one, to work. This only affects horizontal hoiks, though, and they only reach speeds of up to 300 tiles per second. What about the vertical ones? If you watched my Invincibility Machines video, I said that there was a discrepancy between hoiks on PC and hoiks on mobile and console. That discrepancy is related to how you are sent upwards through a vertical hoik when there is a half block platform on top of it. On PC, if there's a half block, you will be sent on top of it automatically, allowing you to squeeze in another tile of movement. On mobile and console, you will not. This video is not a wiring guide. Wiring is way more complicated, but I'm going to explain building a simple dummy engine to activate every game tick, which is 60 times per second. I used this earlier in the video several times, and a few of the later designs use this as well. The idea is that target dummies, which are crafted from hay, which you can collect with the sickle purchased from the merchant, have an invisible hitbox overlaid on top of their sprite. They have to have one, otherwise you couldn't hit them and they wouldn't do anything. This invisible hitbox has collision, so it can be hoiked. Put the dummy on a teleporter and teleport it into two sloped blocks like so. Put pressure plates that will activate when something other than the player steps on it. I usually use red or yellow depending on how I'm feeling. The invisible dummy will immediately be sent left, then right, then left again, triggering the pressure plates each time it moves. There are three caveats to using this design. Firstly, the dummy engine will cease functioning and need to be reactivated if you die. I don't know why this is exactly, but it is inconvenient if you're trying to use it for situations where you may die and respawn, like Pumpkin or Frostmoon. Secondly, the engine will stop if the world is exited. Thirdly, it is loud. It is really loud and annoying. The first two of these problems can be solved by using town NPCs instead of dummies. And you can solve the third problem with this. The only difficulty with NPCs is that they can be more difficult to manipulate into a given position since they actually move around. Building a house that's three wide, like so, and teleporting them into an engine solves that problem. You should also make sure that there are no valid houses for them to teleport to at night, otherwise it will stop functioning. 
When placed inside of a sloped block and you hammer it to be unsloped, you will be automatically placed on top of it. This isn't exactly groundbreaking, it's been known for quite a while. However, the same displacement happens with inactive blocks, which is quite odd. You can enter inside of solid blocks without traditional mounting mechanisms by hammering them in particular ways. This one utilizes the strange inactive block behavior. This one uses the fact that collision is ignored for the block on the tall side of a sloped block. With that, we've pretty much covered all of the hoik mechanics that I'm aware of. The last part of this video is going to be showing off some designs that use them. I introduced the idea of increasing the efficiency of heart statues earlier. That design was pretty clunky and mostly existed to demonstrate the concepts that we had discussed rather than being particularly optimized. Heart generation can get very, very fast, and I can't pretend to fully understand what's going on here because I'm not good with advanced wiring. There's a forum thread that's been ongoing since 2019 working to optimize heart generation, and I got this design from Cryptic. They have made some incredible designs. If you want to learn more about everything going on here, check the thread in the description. This monstrosity is a teleporter catcher. Essentially, regardless of how you exit the teleporter, you'll be put right here. This is an elevator with breakpoints in the middle, which allows you to easily make stops for multiple floors. By pressing up or down, you can keep going. Skeletron in the Drunk and Get Fixed Boy Seeds can be quite tricky due to being underneath a living tree. This is a hoik designed to let you lure him to the surface without having him despawn, since normal vertical hoiks will move you too fast. It's a variation of the elevator with breakpoints. If you struggle with bringing Drunk Skeletron to the surface, building something like this can help. It's possible to make a series of hoiks that all output you to the same location. This accomplishes that task. Conversely, we can make a hoik that takes you in multiple different locations from the same starting point. This one takes you in a different spot depending on whether you press up, down, left, right, or jump. We talked about fast hoiks, but what about slow hoiks? This one moves you at only 20 tiles per second vertically and 40 horizontally. That is drastically slower than normal. Projectiles that persist after touching the ground can be hoiked. Explosives, clown bombs, and even bouncy boulders. Normal boulders will break too quickly, but bouncy boulders can be trapped in a setup like this, where they will continue to spin around for a full minute. Unfortunately, boulder damage against enemies is not very high, so the usefulness is limited. You could go ahead and... And, as the final hoik in this video, I'm going to show you what is quite possibly the most game-breaking design I have seen. I have a sneaking suspicion that this may get patched, so be sure to take advantage of it while you can. Small critters, like worms, buggies, and frogs, are only a single block tall, so they don't get horizontally displaced by hoiks. If you put down an invalid platform, the critter will attempt to walk into the hoik but get sent nowhere, becoming completely immobilized. With that, today's lesson on hoiks is over. I have covered a huge amount of information, from things that have been known for almost a decade to discoveries made this year. I would not have been able to make this without the help of Quasar, who is by far the most knowledgeable person I have met when it comes to hoiks. Most of the designs in this video either came from him directly or were explained to me by him so I could create them. A few weeks ago, I knew far less than I currently do because I learned most of the things in this video from Quasar. I hope that you come out of this video with a much better understanding of how hoiks work and how to use them. They've existed for years as a seemingly complicated and confusing layout of weird triangles, but they're really not too hard to use once you understand the basics.